Chapter 0, 0.0 Intro Part 6. I'm going to do this one. I did this one separately even though it'll be kind of short just because I want to be really clear on this segment for one of your assignments. I'm going to put this video there also. So don't get confused between the content slash subject matter and context the historical or religious significance, that kind of stuff, and the formal aspects of the work. The formal aspects of the work have to do with line and color and the elements and principles of art. Okay, So if you go into part one in that page that's right before uh, page 42, is it counting as a page? Yeah, 41. If you go to page 41, it's going to give you the 10 elements of art, the 10 principles of art. Now, sometimes these are broken down slightly differently. Um, these are called the principles of design sometimes, but here it's called the principles of art. And um, for instance, sometimes pattern is over on the uh, element side, and I'm trying to think. Um, variety is sometimes there. So it really just depends um, on the author's point of view there. Uh, but don't get overly concerned with that. You want to just know what those are and how to use them and how to look at a painting or, you know, I would say other works of art too, which is equally important. But paintings have usually, I would say, more of the elements and principles happening than anything else. So um, we're looking at ways that the artist is communicating through levels of representation <clears throat> and abstraction. We looked at that and we also thought about what the subject matter might be. But there's a lot of clues here what the subject matter might be um, from the elements and principles. And remember that when I was talking about the Mona Lisa a little bit, something is kind of more than the sum of its parts. So the form of a work of art is a totality of what we see when we look at it. So you could say something has a bunch of lines in it, a bunch of squares in it, and a bunch of uh, color in it, right? That's very vague. So that's not going to help us understand what something looks like that well, a little bit. But if you say there are lines running across it horizontally um, and uh, vertically, diagonally, that kind of thing, if you get more descriptive, you tell us where in the work that's happening in the lower left side or the top right, where his feet are, etc. That's what helps us know what you're talking about, what you're seeing. So when we're looking at the totality of it, all those different aspects of the formal principles and elements, that makes up a holistic piece of artwork that is unique. And please don't use that word, by the way, unique, because all artwork is unique, really. Um, it makes up something holistic uh, that you can't really quite put your finger on, right? It, it just hits you all at once. Um, it's not something that a certain amount of this color is exactly going to do that or this or the other because there's other colors that are in the piece as well and they interact with one another. Okay, that's the easiest, hopefully a simple way to talk about this. So these are our list, the two lists here that I mentioned on uh, page uh, 41. So look those over, memorize those. And there's also another list, another sort of like sheet. Um, actually, I'll go there really quick in the course. If you go to the modules, give it a second. If you go to the modules here and you go down to resources, um, no, it's writing, sorry. Elements and principles and other art terms. If you click on this, and you can download this and print this out if you want to, um, but it's going to give you a breakdown of, oh, my numbers are off, but it's going to give you a breakdown of the 10 there and the principles here, okay? So it's important. Sometimes I'll ask you where a focal point is, and you want to talk about what created that focal point. Dramatic contrast is usually your easiest clue. Now, make sure it's correct. Don't just make it up. But that is one of the reasons our eyes focus on something. Red, bright colors is another reason. 
um, value shifts. Now that would be dramatic contrast. There's a lot of, a lot of, there's a, well, I wouldn't say a ton of reasons, but there are a few reasons that create a focal point. Okay. Know what those are. It's really important. Different kinds of rhythms are important to note. You're going to be asked about that. Uh, different kinds of scale. What I notice students doing, and I really have to say I get frustrated, students do this. They look at this list and they go to the first one, color, and they talk about intensity. But you have to name the color. You have to say a, an intense yellow, a bright yellow, and it should be correct. If it's a dull yellow, then you should have said that. But people will say, oh, it has a, the, this artwork has intensity. That is not giving me any information whatsoever. It has to be incorporated into where it is in the work. So make sure you're saying uh, there are intense blues and intense yellows in this work, and this is where they are. So the sky is an intense blue, um, and the, the sun is an intense yellow, for instance. If there's no color in the work, don't bring it up. Okay, many times I see students say the color of black and white. That's not a color. Okay, so go down and, and learn about these different things. And value is what you perhaps want to talk about. White and black, right? So there's different principles. There's different, um, there's different elements. Make sure you understand them and they're using the correct ones. I really have a lot more writing. It's one of the biggest changes I made to the course this semester, and I made a lot of changes, was to get you to write more than once about the elements and principles. Okay, so we know what they are. Let's take a look at our work right here. So this is 0 0.0.23, David Hockney, super famous guy, English artist. He lived in California, um, in the LA area <clears throat> on and off. I think he still has a house here, um, but he, he spends a lot of time in England now in his older years. I want to say he's in his 80s, but um, in the 70s at this point in time, he's a younger man, and um, we're going to look at this painting, and we're going we're gonna to discover some things by looking at the elements and principles. So he's in the Hollywood Hills here, and I'm going to use the book a little bit here because I don't want to miss anything. Um, so one of the first things that the author mentions on page 38 is the contrast of the tiles around the t pool with the bright blue in the pool, right? So we have we have a bright uh, sort of turquoisey blue. We have a little bit of a darker blue blended around here. There's a pretty stark contrast with the lighter colored tile. This has really got a lot of pop. Now, when you say something pops, you're going to have to say contrasting colors or values or something, okay? So in this case, if I would say um, the blue really pops against the beigey yellow of the tiles going around, this, the, the light-colored tiles with the richer, um, brighter blue, okay? So if you just say something like, oh yeah, it pops, that doesn't give us anything. Another really interesting focal point in this painting would be uh, the red jacket against the green. Part of the reason, and you don't know this yet because you haven't read chapter 1.4, but the uh, color red and the color green are complementaries. So when you have two complementaries together, that makes visual contrast and you notice it more. The basic complementary colors are Christmas, that's the red, green, Broncos, which would be kind of a gold blue, which we have here, blue, and kind of a lighter gold, that's a bit of a stretch, and Lakers, which is like a purple and an orange. So that's the easiest way I can tell you about complementary colors, but those are the ones that are going to grab your attention the most. Red, as a color just by itself, if there was no green, is going to grab our attention first and foremost. Why? We looked at a piece earlier of congealed and um, cast blood. Blood is red. Red is important. Fire is also uh, red. So these are dangerous things. We know it deeply in our psyche um, and animals too. And I don't know exactly what colors they're seeing, but I'm quite sure blood in some way, form, or shape uh, gives them some kind of a no notice. Maybe the smell of it, I don't know. But for us, the visual of red uh, sets off alarm bells. You know, you think about a fire truck, you think about a stop sign, that kind of thing. So 
red is a really important color in art. One joke that, that I heard a lot in grad school, if you can't make it good, make it big. And if you can't make it big, make it red. So sometimes, <laughs> you know, in a crush before the work is due, somebody will spray paint something red and it's just like the worst thing you ever saw, but at least it's red. So people will look at it. So that is kind of a crutch or a device that is used by artists to get your attention. Now with graphic design, this gets pushed a lot further um, and the idea of using red is meant to really grab your attention and sell you something. And I bet you anything, after I've said that, you're going to go and look at some television or something or other, drive around, you're going to notice some red grabbing your attention with some kind of an adver advertisement. Nothing comes to mind. Coca-Cola, I guess. But there's all kinds of stuff. All right, so we have our contrast back into our pool here of our gold with our blue. That's one. Um, we also have a, uh, the lush greens and the aquamarines behind it. So we have kind of, how are they describing that? Okay, sorry. With the dazzling bright blue, pool, blue of the part of the pool in the middle ground and the lush greens and sparkling aquamarine in the hills immediately behind. The hills furthest from us are painted in lighter, hazier color using atmospheric perspective. So the contrast is really this shape here, uh, sort of an L shape. So this has a bit of a diagonal. It's not a super straight line. And that is a horizontal. And then the contrast is between this and this blue and the dark greens here. So we have contrast between that. We also have contrast and complementary colors between the jacket and, and the hills. Then, when we're looking in the distance, we really sense distance by atmospheric perspective. Atmospheric, boy, I'm getting tongue-tied. Atmospheric perspective is a couple of things. One of them is, you notice how blue and hazy it is? Now, if you live in the desert, you don't get this phenomenon as well as in some places. Because there's not as not much moisture in the air. And remember, uh, you, somebody's probably told you, oh, that that mountain is actually, you know, miles away. It's like, oh, it looks like it's right here. Well, that deceptiveness is when there's no moisture in the air because the hazy, the moisture in the air that we're seeing here, that tells us that something's far away. So we have a different humidity here in Los Angeles. It's still not very high compared to some places in the world. But we do get that atmospheric perspective where we're looking through, literally, we're looking through all that moisture the further back we go so things get fuzzier, okay? So notice that we have dark green right here, really dark green right here, and that this hill is medium. It's kind of still greenish, but it's going blue and it's going fuzzy. So that's two things that happen with atmospheric perspective. Things get fuzzier as they get farther away, and they get bluer as they get farther away. And um, the other part of that, the, the sort of the antithesis of that, is things closer up get more detailed because we can see them better, right? So if you look at these tiles, if you notice how there's just kind of some uh, general color on them, as they get closer, there's more detail on, on the tiles. We see that there's some chips or multiple colors on these stones or or um, I don't know, they could be ceramic tile, but I think they look to me kind of like those stones that get those sort of chipped surfaces. So we start to see more detail as we get closer to where we are, where we're, we're the viewer, we get closer to the viewer over here. Okay, so that's atmospheric perspective. A lot of times what you'll see in a landscape, uh, perhaps not a swimming pool or a house kind of a thing, but like where these trees would be right here, those are going to be super distinct. The trees would be super distinct and crisp right here. But we do see that a bit here where these trees have some definition, some shading. There's a shadow on the bottom and there's a bit of leaves painted in here, a little bit of detail. And then that hill gets less distinct, that hill's less distinct, less, less, less. So that's one of the, the parts of atmospheric perspective. So that conveys a sense of distance and the, this is just... Formal analysis, we're getting a sense of perhaps the emotional temperature of this piece about distance and longing um, just from these elements and principles. We have a sense of space. Um, the pool and the standing figure on the right occupy more than half the surface. 
So this is taking up a big chunk of space here, right? And then the overlapping of the hills. That goes hand in hand with atmospheric perspective. It is not atmospheric perspective in itself. Um, earlier paintings that you see pre-Renaissance before this method was used, you will see overlapping. And some cultures just use overlapping. See how this hill overlaps that hill. This uh, pool overlaps that tree. Uh, he overlaps this tile right there. So we know that those things are closer to us. So that's a device used, and sometimes with atmospheric perspectives that we see here, sometimes without it. Okay, so we're going to look at uh, the difference between shapes in a painting. Shapes have uh, Paintings have shapes, sculptures have forms. Okay, form can be implied, but basically when you're talking about a two-dimensional work such as this, you're going to use shapes. So geometric is square, so see all these squares here. We have tons of squares, we have lines, lines are also geometric. A pool, of course, is man-made, so therefore it is geometric. Geometric shape, so we have um, a big uh, square rectangular pool, probably we're just truncated here, um, but those are our geometric shapes. We get into things that grow or are living, then we're gonna non-man-made things, then that is organic. Figures are organic, he's got a lot of curvature, his face has irregular shapes. His body has irregular shapes. The water is kind of undulating here, and we see these irregular shapes. So those are organic shapes. Trees, of course, are organic because they're growing. So a leaf, if your 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 uh, go-to shape when you're thinking of the different of geometric and abstract, I would say with geometric, think about a door frame or a room, and it with um, sorry, not abstract organic think of a leaf shape all right so that's the difference between those two things there and remember we're in a two-dimensional surface so um, the other thing we want to think about is emphasis our figure is emphasized remember because he's red versus the green here plus he's just plain old red he's very large and tall and he's not quite in the foreground but he's edging toward it and he's very large. So the largeness of his figure relative to the other things in the picture, that's a sense of scale. So that gives us a sense that he is larger and more important, first of all, that's hierarchical scale. Um, these two figures are, are probably the same, but because he's lighter color and less defined, we're not looking at him as much. So we're focusing on this figure more, and we can see more of him, and we can see his face. But back to the idea that he's large, that has to do with scale versus these other things. Now, if this particular painting was about trees, or if it was about mountains, those things would be uh, in the foreground, and he would be small looking up at the mountains, perhaps. That, that would be a guess there. Um, so he is our focal point. Uh, what else do I want to say? So we start to learn, as we start to read about this um, from the artist's life, that this is uh, David Hockney's former lover, this fellow here. They've broken up. So there's kind of a sense of longing and sadness, and you can see him looking at the swimmer who might become, or maybe already is, the new lover. So Hockney kind of puts him in the pool and doesn't want to deal with him, sort of, and um, he's looking at this lover in detail, this ex-lover in detail, and it's sort of a farewell, if you will, or a distancing picture where, where he's over here, he's out of the picture, he's not part of the party, he's not part of what's going on. So it's detachment, absence um, on page 39, and the fracturing of the lines in the pool, all this disturbance and turbulence is relating to the fracture of the relationship. So there's many times where you're going to get clues about the emotional content or the cultural content or um, many other things of what's going on by the elements and principles. If you think of Edvard Munch's The Scream, which all of you I think could conjure up, the crazy brightness of those colors and those extreme abstraction of that skeletal figure, then you understand his anguish and his frustration because of the dark extreme colors and um, 
the the strangeness of the lines and the chaos in that photo in that sorry in that painting so in this painting we looked over a lot of different segments of it just refer back to this um, you also have this in the book and I'm gonna make sure I didn't miss anything here um, so yes these formal aspects come together to put paint and create this portrait of lost love there's a lot of um, shape and implied line uh, Sometimes things are actual lines versus implied lines. Uh, it's a little, I don't know that I want to get into that here as much because this is an actual line um, of the surface of this here. And then an implied line would be more like uh, the top of the tree, like the the edge of this tree is an implied line, if that makes sense. So it's not like a hard line that you actually see. So these are also lines and they're irregular, forming white irregular lines, forming organic blue sort of sh shapes that are irregular. Okay, well I hope that helps you out.